this week on The Destination Angler. You know what? I started this question off in a cheeky manner, but it's about as remote as you can get. That, yeah, it sounds like it. There, like there's no roads up there. You're taking flow planes in. Yeah, there's no roads. There's no people. There's no other outfitters. It's one of the only places I can think of on planet Earth where there is truly, you know, very little footprints or handprints or, or mark of man aside from us. And that was Jake Daly on the Spot CZ Wilderness. Welcome to the Destination Angler Podcast, the podcast for anglers who travel. And I'm your host, Steve Haig. We go right to the source, the local guides and experts, to build your knowledge of top fishing locations around North America. It's a big world out there. Now go and fish it. I'm going away for a while. But I'll be back soon. Hey anglers, welcome back to another episode of the Destination Angler. Up next on the Destination Angler, we explore Montana's remarkable turnaround story, the Clark Fork of the Columbia River. After that, we venture to the Yakagani River in western Pennsylvania in pursuit of giant brown trout on the fly. And be sure to backcast to catch the last episode on the Border Brule River in northern Wisconsin for wild brookies and browns. Hey, if you like the show, please give us a share, like, or follow, and be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Have you had a chance to check out my new podcast yet? The Destination Angler Adventures podcast is the podcast about life and fly fishing, where we put you, the angler, center stage to tell your stories and share your adventures. Hey, drop me a line. Let me know what you think. And today, our destination is the unspoiled Spatsizi Wilderness Park in northern British Columbia. Our guide for this journey is none other than Jake Daly, seasoned fly fishing expert and manager of Spatsizi River Outfitters. Roadless and uninhabited, Spotsizi is 2 million acres of wild, rugged, and remote wilderness unchanged by man, offering some of the best fly fishing on the planet. Jake's roots trace back to nearby Smithers, B.C., but his passion for fly fishing and guiding took him far and wide across the West. Eventually, in his 30s, he returned to his hometown, living in his parents' basement for a time, guiding steelhead and honing his skills until he found his calling at Spotsizi River Outfitters. Today, Jake shares his adventures of double-digit bull trout, bears wrestling in boats, the largest manhunt in B.C. history, and how the Collingwood brothers founded the operation after landing 126 trout on 126 casts. Stick around to the end for a shore lunch tip like none other, how to cook trout in a frying pan made from an Arctic birch tree. No joke. Let's hear from Jake. Well, hey, folks, I've got Jake Daly here on the line and super excited to talk about Spat CZ. It's This is a, a wilderness area that i got to be honest, I never heard of it until one of my listeners reached out to me and said, hey, I'm going to this really cool place next year and uh, you got to check them out. So I started looking into this and bumped into Jake, who's the, the runs the lodge and uh, takes guys fishing every day up there. And it sounded awesome. So I'm really excited that you guys are going to get a chance to hear about this place because it sounds pretty incredible. Welcome to the show, Jake. Hey, thanks a lot for having me on. It's uh, super fun. Yeah, for sure. So you are you are where today? You're in a little town in, in northern BC, aren't you? Yeah, a uh, quaint little town of Smithers, BC. Uh, people call it northern BC. Uh, if you know Canada, way on the left, the furthest left province, it's yeah. called uh, British Columbia. We're about halfway up. And um, the town's about 5,000 people, and it sits on the Bulkley River, which is kind of famous in the steelhead world it's a tributary sure. of the skeena watershed and so yeah i'm just at my place i was telling you before we started recording i've been kicked into the the guest room here to have a chat with you all good it's all good so one of the things you told me when we talked a couple of weeks ago which you like to do in the summer was i was really surprised by that you like to go uh surfing don't you um well i wish it was in the summer steve but it's actually uh, the best waves hit the coast here in the in the winter, and in the so winter. yeah, so yeah, that's what um, that's where I just came back from to do a little film uh, work here in Smithers. But uh, my wife Emma and I, we... I'm just I just lost you there for a second. We lost your audio. Yeah, audio just left left us here. 
Huh. There, it's back. It's back. Weird. Finicky, okay. eh? Anyway. Okay. Um, when did it cut out? Uh, you and your wife. Right. So, um, yeah, my wife, Emma, and I, we spend uh, a lot of time on Haida Gwaii, which is an island off the coast of British Columbia, not far from here. And, um, yeah, that's where I just came from. And I think where we first connected and, um, yeah, it's, fr it's freezing. You can, s you can skate on the lakes and there's snow and winter storms coming in, but it's also a uh, good time for surfing. If you've got a thick wetsuit and, Man. um, <laughs> and you feel like that's, hopping in the ocean. <laughs> that's hardcore. How, how are the sharks that time of year? Um, well, you sound like Emma. She's always talking about sharks. I try not, I try to avoid the topic. Don't even uh, really talk about it. They're in there. You then, know what? Huh? Um, well, okay. I, I gravitate to, I gravitate to facts that I, that I like. And one fact I heard is that, um, yeah, like great whites, that's the one we would see, I guess that you'd worry about chewing on your leg and they don't come up in numbers as far as we are. I don't know, just their territory, I guess down in Washington or, Oregon or California, you, you know, you run into people that have like straight up shark attack stories, like pretty regularly, but, yeah. um, yeah, up in Haida Gwaii, I don't know. I'm surfing with a clear mind. You got two legs to prove it. I've got, yeah, I've got all my digits and so far so good. Five, five fingers in both hands and everything. Okay. That's good yeah. to hear. All right. So, um, for those folks who have never heard of Spats Easy, just how remote is this area? I guess it's a matter of perspective, Steve. Uh, you know, a, a long time ago, there were people that uh, lived there. So um, it was home to them. And for me and folks in Smithers, it's it's kind of in our backyard. It's a, it's a you know, depending on what kind of float plane you're in, it's about a two hour float plane ride north of uh, Smithers. And so folks that are coming to visit us, they'll fly in. Uh, usually, if they're if they're from out of the country, they'll fly into Vancouver. Then they'll catch uh, another flight up to Smithers, and then they'll hop on a float plane two hours north. I, you know what? I started this question off in a cheeky manner, but it's about as remote as you can get. Yeah, it sounds like it. There, like there's no roads up there. You're taking float planes in. Yeah, there's no roads. There's no people. There's no other outfitters. There's it's one of the only places I can think of on planet earth where there is truly, you know, very little, uh, footprints or handprints or, or mark of man aside yeah. from us. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's a privilege to be up there and it's, Sorry. it's something that you kind of have to immerse yourself in and experience to fully understand. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the scenery up there. Cause I, I've been online and looked, I mean, it looks absolutely spectacular. I got to believe your it blows your clients minds as they're flying in on these full planes and looking at this. Right. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Um, so it's the Spatsizi plateau provincial park. It's named for this plateau and it's an interior kind of Alpine plateau. So okay. when you fly from Smithers, you're flying through the um, you know, some pretty ragged, you know, high peaks, you know, six, seven, 8,000 foot peaks. And, um, basically you fly up the Skeena drainage, you tip over into the headwaters of the Stikine where we're at. And, um, and then sort of right where our lodge is up at the, at the top, the terrain kind of flattens out. So you okay. can look, you can look to one side and you'll see just the most epic mountains you've ever seen crawling with goats and caribou and all kinds of stuff. And then you look the other way and it's just these insane flat, kind of tabletops huh. um really unique terrain and scenery and ecosystem and uh yeah it's, it's it's a big country i mean it's hard to describe it because it's two million acres it's twice the size of yellowstone and really? it's we're, we're basically talking about a you know a substantial chunk of british columbia that we access um you know with float planes and i'm sure we'll get into the whole thing but uh you can't really describe it because it, it's it's multiple regions within a you know, within this huge zone. Yeah. It sounds like a combination of kind of super rugged and, um, and then some plateau stuff. Then obviously you've got, imagine in every drainage, you've got a trout stream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's incredible. We're in, um, we're, yeah, there's tons of drainages. Um, we're in a, you know, I'm a rambler, so rein me in if you need to, but we're, we're in this yeah. zone that's, um, it's been, uh, 
it's been sort of nicknamed the sacred headwaters and um, by a, an author and conservationist, Wade Davis. And uh, that name stuck um, because of just, I guess, the, the importance of the region. And the, um, yeah, it's kind of a catchy name, but the right where we're at is the headwaters of the Stikine. But just over the hill from us is the very headwaters of the Skeena, uh, wow. you know, another really iconic sure, major famous. system. Sure. Right, exactly. And then, you know, over a couple other ranges within 10 kilometers, you got the headwaters of the Nass, um, which drains out into the Pacific just north of the Skeena, another okay. huge system. Um, the this, Stikine, this obviously, a, a Pacific drainage that uh, wraps around and, um, and uh, dumps into the Pacific up by Wrangell, Alaska. Um, but then um, just, I guess, east of us is the divide where all systems head north and we've got tributaries to the Arctic. So oh, cool. from an angling perspective, uh, you know, there's so many different zones and then you can pick apart each one of those drainages and, you know, kind of get more granular and in yeah. each thing, it's kind of like a, yeah, it's just really neat to see all these different environments that are existing and evolving separate from each other. And it's just, it's crazy, man. If yeah. you're an angler, it's a, it's a candy store. Yeah, it sounds like it. I'd be a kid in a candy shop for sure. And, Absolutely. And, you're going to have and, to come up. I told you before, you're going to have to come up. <laughs> Got to save my money and do a trip to Smithers. That sounds pretty awesome. Never been to BC. It's definitely on the bucket list. I've done a couple of shows with, with folks from BC and uh, it really, it sounds like an absolute mecca. And it's a huge province it's bigger than texas you know everybody in, in the states it's alaska than texas and everything else and you guys are not as big as alaska but you're bigger than texas so right okay cool. wow that's uh that's crazy a um, lot of land. yeah it's a big it's a big old uh big old piece of land and um yeah there's some really special spots many special spots in it but the yeah. stats easy sure is one all right. So tell me about the fishing, because some of the things I've read and talking to you, it's it's supposedly great dry fly fishing. You guys are fishing a different river every day. Some of these rivers maybe haven't seen an angler all year. Is, is all that true? Yeah, I mean, totally. We don't we don't even touch all the rivers and uh, all the spots that you can access in a given year. So sometimes you're going to a spot that hasn't been fished for several years. Um, yeah. Obviously, the spots closer to the lodge will hit them more regularly. Um, the window to fish up there is pretty pretty small, actually. Yeah. Um, we usually head up mid June to kind of get the camp going and um, set everything up and see, you know, how much bears got into and what broke and what froze and and try and fix it before people show up. Uh, usually, first clients are last week of June. Yeah. Um, but I remember it not this year, but the year before we were flying in, we tipped over into the Stikine. We're like within 10 kilometers of the lodge and the lake just above us was still a skating rink. Oh, really? And it's like, so it's like, Oh my, are we even going to be able to land on oh, last really? week? Really? Yeah. It was like that. Hey, but, um, so we get, you know, we start fishing as soon as we can. And, um, you know, the, the insects at that time of year are not as plentiful and airborne and, and on the surface. So sometimes it's kind of a slow start to start, you know, get the fish looking up okay. and um, you know, they're doing their, they're doing their spring thing. They all have different activities, the different types of fish and in the different systems. But, uh, but yeah, it starts, it starts a little slow with the dry fly. Um, but there are advantages to those early weeks, big time, but then kind of, as you move into a little bit warmer weeks, you know, into that start of July, mid July yeah. and right through July, uh, the bugs just start going crazy. Everything starts hatching. And then, um, yeah, it's just totally bonkers. Um, we basically, once we start, you know, we encourage people just to fish dry fly and, um, you know, and unless times get crazier, you're trying to work on something specific. Yeah. It's, it's 90% yeah. of the time we're fishing tries. Are you no kidding? And what kind of fish do you have up there? Um, we, I guess, traditionally this, the, the fish that most people come up for is, uh, the rainbow. Okay. We've got a bunch of, bunch of different types of rainbow, different strains. And, um, so that's traditionally the sport fish that people are excited about. We also have Arctic grayling in a few of the spots that we go to, which are really a, a beautiful fish. I don't right. know if you've seen those or I'm sure you, sure you have, seen them. they've got that beautiful, yeah, beautiful. fin and, mm -hmm. 
kind of like a white fish in appearance. Those are really, really neat. And, and, um, we get some nice size, uh, grayling and, um, but more and more, um, I think maybe because the guides have, have myself included have sort of been, uh, super excited about it more and more. The, uh, clients are showing up excited to chase bull trout ah. and, um, bull trout are sort of the top, um, they are the, the top of the aquatic food chain and, uh, there's so much, so much to learn about their behavior and uh, their life history and and the different groups of them. Huh. And uh, yeah, they just roam around and they get humongous and they grow old and they're they're predatory and aggressive. And yeah. um, so it sort of depends what you're into, but those are primarily Arctic grayling, rainbow, and bull trout are the three fish that we're um, setting out after on any given day. Yeah, it sounds like fun. So yeah. So up there, it sounds like you can target bull trout. It's not a problem. Yeah, I think I'm trying to think if there there are there are a couple of um, spots we go where there are not bull trout. Okay, and that's that's fun too, right? Um, it because bull trout alter what the what the rainbow populations and grayling populations look like. Ah. So some, sometimes it's fun to go to a spot where there's you know no big bull predators chowing on rainbow, yeah. uh, but most of the spots I would say. Uh, the majority of spots that we go to, you have a shot at, at really big bull trout and yeah. Um, yeah, they're, they're either there or they're not. But once you, once you, once you see one, there's a good chance that you're in a school of them um, oh, really? because they kind of move around in a pack, sort of like a pack of wolves. Yeah. And so um, yeah, once, once you find them, it's, it's pretty neat to, to see if you can see a couple of them and, and just for the sake of like, learning more about them like okay how many are in this pack there's usually like a um there's usually like a largest one like sort of like the the leader of the pack there'll be the sure. big the big one and they all sort of follow it around and huh. um on any given season we can we can kind of get tabs on where the different groups of bull trout are you know roughly yeah and um it's fun to see how they react to the different conditions throughout the summer and so yeah it's it's fun it's it's just a big it's just a big, crazy, beautiful world up there. And it's fun to observe it and, and see scary. what all these fish and animals do when there aren't a bunch of humans mucking it up for them. Exactly. Now, do you, so are you actually spotting these bull trout and then sight fishing the bull trout with, with a dry fly? Or are you throwing a big chunk of meat at them? Like a stream? They'll come up for, uh, they'll come up for dries. Um, cool. Yeah, big time. They'll come up for, they'll wow. come up for little dries. Just sort of depends what's going on. Um, but they're usually what'll happen is you'll be at a spot and you'll be fishing a school of rainbow and the commotion from catching a few rainbow will draw the attention of the bull trout oh, okay. and the bull trout will come in like, Oh, there's like something's going on, right? Something's getting attacked. Something's injured. Yeah. Something's eating something. And I want, I want to get in the mix. And so you'll be hanging out at a spot. You'll catch a few fish and all of a sudden it's like, yeah, you can see them come right in like to your feet and you're like, okay, that's like a double digit bull trout. And, um, basically while well, myself and, and all the guys were on the program where, you know, we'll get guys coming up and bringing their, their trout rods with them, but then we'll bring, uh, like dedicated bull trout rig, you know, a little bit bigger stick, like a six or yeah. whatever, seven with uh -huh. a sink tip and uh -huh. like a heavier leader, you know, 12 pound leader or 15, or whatever and uh you know a nice weighted streamer and we'll just have it have it with us have it in the boat have it around and then if really? uh, if things start happening you're like okay take this sure, take sure. this like go yeah. go go and it's pretty fun that so, some great. people love yeah some people it's you gotta really twist their arm because it's not not really an elegant uh yeah. or enjoyable casting experience right yeah um but once you you know once you hook into one um yeah people yeah. get pretty zoned in on it it's, it's pretty pretty cool What's in a, in a season? What's the, you know, what, what kind of, what, what size bull trout are you guys pulling in during the season? Like big ones, average ones, that kind of thing. Um, anything, you know, anything over, you know, anything over like six or seven pounds, it'll be like, Oh sweet. That's a nice, nice one. Yeah. Um, but then it steps up, you know, they, they're sort of in like, um, they're sort of almost like grouped. Like you'll have, uh, you'll have smaller ones like juveniles that are maybe like, a pound or something then you'll have lots of them that are maybe like three or four pounds and then you kind of step it up to you know kind of like a 
you know, I don't want to like, I don't want to state things that I don't know a hundred percent for sure, but I think like, you know, maybe that, um, you know, five year old that's, you know, and plus that gets yeah. into the, you know, seven pound, six, seven pound range. Okay. And then, then the really special ones are double digits. So yeah, anything, nice. you know, over 10 pounds is exciting. Um, you know, I've got myself and, and clients that I've been with have got, you know, well over honest 15 pound bull trout. And, um, last year, oh. unfortunately I wasn't involved in this one, but, uh, there was, yeah, like a, a over 20 pound bull trout. So, so they, they just, yeah, yeah, they get big and they grow really old. You know, that fish should be near 20 years old. Wow. And, no uh, kidding. Yeah. How many, yeah, they're, they're endlessly fascinating. How, how many how, inches? How, yeah. How long is a 20 pound bull trout? Um, you know, 32, 30, it's like pushing, it's like over 30 inches. And, okay. um, and then it just gets like fat. They really, yeah. they start morphing, you know, once they get over, um, 10 pounds, once they kind of get into that later stage of life, yeah. they start taking on different colors. So you'll see green ones, you'll see silver ones, you'll see like kind of yellow ones, gold huh. ones, and, um, they get really kipey they get big like gnarly heads yeah, sure and th and they show their they show their kind of scars right their heads are all I i'm gonna say it like, kind of got like a patina from their uh time huh. in from their time in the land right 20 years of just rooting around for things and fight yeah it's gnarly man yeah. and so like some of the lakes where where we have the biggest bull trout the rainbow are maybe you know not as big they'll be like lots of rainbow in that 10 to 12, 14, 16 inch range. Okay. And, um, you know, we don't keep the bull trout here cause, uh, it's, they, they almost got fished to extinct extinction in BC previously. Oh. So they're, they're not on the, um, keep them list and we're a, you know, catch and release fishery obviously, but, yeah. um, you know, inside the gut of these, these big rainbow or big bull trout are, you know, there can be up to like six full, rainbow trout in there oh my gosh wow yeah it's it's nuts it's just they're totally crazy yeah. they just eat entire rainbow trouts another yeah, another wild yeah. thing mm. is uh you can catch a rainbow trout and uh be playing it blah 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 and then all of a sudden your rod just bends in half and your <laughs> rainbow trout is like on a like 100 meter run and there's nothing you can do um but it, it's been eaten by a bull trout yeah and so it's just off this it exhilarating goes mysterious yeah. like yeah it's just this, like fascinating i, like, I think predatory. i saw a video a video on your website where somebody was fishing and a bull truck came along and chowed his his rainbow and, and <laughs> right they, they got a kick out of that i think they actually thought that was pretty cool do do they uh, do, 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 do you usually get those those fish in like you usually catch that bull trout who's who's grabbed your rainbow or do they usually let go um kind of a mixed bag uh they you know i'd say more often than not they let go yeah. And, um, yeah, but yeah, it's very common to catch a rainbow that has, you know, teeth marks on it from that season or seasons prior you yeah. get them and they're all just scarred up. Like literally they've been, you know, someone's sandwich a few times. Yeah. And, uh, oh my gosh. Yeah. It's a jungle I, down there, Steve. I, I wonder if the rainbow that have bull trot around are a little hardier and fight a little harder because they're kind of on the run all the time. Yeah, I don't. You know, that's a kind of a cool theory. Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, they're definitely, uh, they're definitely looking over their little fishy shoulders. I tell you what, it's like, yeah, but pretty wild. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about the rainbow fishing. So that's kind of like maybe the star of the show. That I mean, I always think of British Columbia. That's where rainbows are from, you know. And rainbows from all over the world came, you know, pretty much from British Columbia. Or the people in California will tell you they're the McLeod Red Band rainbows are the most distributed rainbow in the world i don't know but anyway they're all from out that way uh what do people love about rainbow fishing what do you think uh it's a good question i mean it's a beautiful fish you couldn't it paint is. a more beautiful creature right it's just the different colors and the iridescent uh nature and and also the variety the different ways that different strains are spotted and the different sizes that they grow they're i mean from an angling perspective they're yeah they fight like crazy they're yeah. eager to take a dry. Um, I, I mean, I, the thing that I find interesting about them is there's there's a lot to learn, right? They're different. 
um, before I went to Spats Easy, I was just, you know, trying to catch a fish and, uh, you know, you try and figure out what would work and you get the fish and you'd be like, okay, hey, that's how you get the fish here. Awesome. Yeah. But, um, fishing up in Spats Easy is kind of interesting because there's so many fish. They haven't, you know, seen a lot of flies and you can kind of crack some new codes on like, okay, they're not all the same. They're not all behaving the same, whether it's like different ages or in different temperatures or different parts of the season or different trips. So, um, I think one of the funnest things about fishing for rainbow is trying to crack the code and, wow. um, and just, just see how they're all different. Yeah. Interesting. So, so as you're going to these different rivers, I always feel like when I go to a new river, it takes me a little while to get dialed in. You know, it may, it may take a couple of days in, in some cases, obviously you guys are up there for a while, but sort of what's the conversation you're having with your anglers in the morning as you're heading out, particularly early in the week when they're first up there. Right. Yeah. When, okay. So that's a funny, that's a funny um, kind of evolution of attitudes and conversations, right? When oh. people first get off the plane, they're yeah. kind of like twitching out and they're uh, super anxious and they just like, <laughs> can't wait to like, like, let's go, let's go. Like, they're just like waiters on what kind of fly, what kind of whatever, let's go. And um, I guess like for when anglers first show up, you know, we try and get them into, into fish right away. Um, and uh, try and give them a little bit of intel on where we're at in the season in each different spot, right? Like what are, you know, what's hatching? What are they, what are they eating? What's working? Also, where are they? You know, the, the mm. concentrations of rainbow move around uh, throughout the season, but also um, season to season. Some of our best oh. spots will be like totally empty the next year and vice versa. Really? So. Oh. Basically, you know, we've got our, we've got our favorite flies, um, but you bring out some big stuff, you bring up some small stuff, you, you know, you bring a couple streamers just in case and some nymphs just in case you get desperate. And then you, you try and bring as much stuff as you can. And then um, often you, you work together to crack the code, but uh, yeah, throughout the season, um, I, I guess uh, uh, typically, you know, early in the season, you're going to want to be smaller and you're going to want to be, okay. um, a little you know things are a little spookier and selective oh, really? it, and early then, in the season they're spookier earlier and smaller oh that's interesting well i don't know there's 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 no real rule but i would say i would say earlier in the season yeah earlier in the season especially to get them to come up for a dry you're you're taking a more careful approach and you've got longer leaders and you're you're, you're maybe switching flies more to try and figure out what's going on. Are you really yeah. paying attention? And then as you get deeper into the season, the amount of bugs and the type of bugs and um, just like the density of and okay. variety of insects just blows up. And um, huh. yeah. And then, you know, we can talk insects and flies all you want, but just like put on a big piece of foam and like, whatever, let's just cruise around and see what's out there. It just kind of, it kind of gets crazy. Um, so they're, they're not and that then selective. On that, Is that what you're saying? They're usually not yeah. that selective. Or there's just so many fish and there's so many different insects that something's going to be interested in what you're throwing. Okay. I don't know if we talked about this before, but um, there's there's one fire there's one river up there. It's called the Fire Steel, and mm -hmm. it's famous for its density of trout. It's one of the one of the rivers that doesn't have bull trout. It's a rainbow system, and um, yeah, there, there are different, you know, pools there. You can stop and you'd be like, okay, this looks like a sweet little piece of water. Let's kind of pick it apart. And, um, you know, maybe, maybe you start it with an Adams, you know, start with a small Adams and you kind of get guys trying those classic or purple or whatever. And, and, oh yeah, that's working good. Look at that. You know, we get like half a dozen and we like kind of move over a little bit, another half a dozen, and then it kind of cools off and you're like, okay, well, hmm, is that all the fish here? Maybe. Uh, let's try something else. So you throw it something bigger on, you know, like a larger caddis or a stonefly or, or whatever you can go subsurface. And sure enough, there's like different fish cluing into different food. You can catch another six or 10 and then it'll cool off. And then you switch flies and there's different really? fish clued on the, in the in same the, on those. So you just keep switching flies and you keep doing well It's by switching flies in the same area. Yeah. I wouldn't say that like that's, my like guiding and fishing approach. Like we're not okay. trying to like catch every fish in the pool, but yeah. um, 
but yes, it works like that. And the kind of a theory that I've come up with is that fish are a little bit like humans and they have different favorite foods, right? So you'll have some fish that are, you know, clued in on cheeseburgers and some that are, um, you know, vegan. And, um, and so you can just kind of like rotate through and, um, yeah. like for, okay. So on the fire steel, for example, on the surface, very, very hard to get like a huge fish. And so you'll have some guys like they'll be going through all their, you know, they'll be getting real scientific and they'll be trying to get everything on the top. And it's like, Oh, it's just little fish. What's going on. And, um, you know, if you work long enough, it's, it's really hard because there's so many little fish uh, competing for the food. Okay. But, um, you know, if you can get something down or, or if you can crack the code to some, to some different food source, uh, there are really large fish in there as well. Um, it's just such a competitive feeding area. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. It's, yeah. I don't know. It's interesting and it's always different. And it's the, the, the fish, you know, I think about fish in, in lakes that are frozen for nine months out of the year, you know, for those three months that ice is off, they get ravenous, right? I mean, you would be too, right? I really haven't had a good meal in, in nine months, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, in your season is what, only eight weeks long up there? Um, Something like that. We squeeze in a ninth week sometimes. Okay. Um, but yeah, things tend, tend to kind of uh, slow down in August. Um, in August. Yeah. Like you say, so in the spring, like just each fish, uh, each species has a different life cycle uh, or annual kind of life history. Yeah. But um, the rainbow in, in the spring, not long after ice off, they're spawning. Yeah. So, um, you know, obviously that, that means there are fish that you want to not target, but mm -hmm. it also means that like the party is, the party is in the moving water. Like all the fish are in there yeah. and, you know, in turn, the bull trout are in there. And so you've got like a high density of rainbow in the, in the rivers and then okay. once and the streams, and then once they're done spawning or that's kind of tapering off or most of them have, or whatever, it's like a, um, kind of a revolving window, you know, they're still in there and there's, you know, insects and blah, blah, blah. And it's quite a lively place. But then as you kind of taper off late July, June, um, temperatures start increasing, especially last year. And I, kind of nervous to see what happens this year, but when you have like lower water levels and mm -hmm. higher temperatures, um, you know, the river started having higher temperatures earlier. And so the rainbow will back out and then, um, you know, by August they'll be, you know, they'll be in the lake and they'll be deep oh, or they'll okay. be in depending okay. on the system, but yeah. they tend to back out and then maybe poke in, poke in again, once the waters cool off in the fall. Okay. And so are you fishing mostly rivers or are you also, it sounds like you're doing some lake fishing as well. Uh, no, all moving water. Okay. Lots, lots of inlets and outlets. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, like all moving water. I, some guys are really excited about still water and um, I'm going to plead ignorance. Like I think maybe still water is something that I'll get into later in life. <laughs> and there's so many amazing lakes, right? We're using float planes to get around. So every time yeah. we take off or land, we're on a lake. Yeah. And, um, but no, we're, we're, we're kind of focusing on the moving water, the rivers, the streams, the inlets and the outlets. Um, gotcha. you know, and I think it's just cause it's fun, you know, that's the kind of fishing that we're into and that's what the clients are into. And, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the program. Okay. Well, give it, so give me a sense of what the experience is like with your lodge. So it's, it's the Spatsisi River Outfitters Lodge. Is that correct? And yeah, we've been calling it. Um, so Spatsisi River Outfitters is the, you know, kind of the, the company. And there's two sides to it. The, um, there's a hunting side and a fishing side. So I manage the fishing side. The hunting side kind of roams all over the place. They've got different lodges and cabins and spike camps and, and whatever. Oh, the, yeah. the fishing side, the fly fishing program is run out of our lodge um, on Last Louis Lake in the headwaters of the Stikine. And so, um, yeah, I guess the program is you, you fly up to the headwaters of the Stikine and then you're there with us for... Um, you're there with us for the week and, yep. uh, and we explore from there. Okay. And like, what happens? What's a typical day? Right. So 
it's it's not like steelhead angling or salmon fishing or it's not it's we're the only ones there right so we're not we're not waking up at four we're not waking up at three we're um i think we do breakfast at you know seven seven thirty we'll do you know coffee's on at six for the early risers if you want to come yeah. hang out on the dock or or uh whatever place to do go or, or check out the news or whatever but we do breakfast at like seven seven thirty and then um at that time we'll have you know names on the board right kind of classic uh fishing lodge deal you know you got your guides and then you've got you know who's with what which clients with which guide and where you're going and um Sometimes the clients, especially the ones that have been up here before, or maybe ones that have like watched some videos or it's like a life bucket list thing, they like yeah. have a few specific things, right? So they'll often pull me aside and at the beginning of the week and they'll be like, Jake, I really need to get to, or I really yeah. want to go fishing it. And then, uh, I'm like, okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll try and make that happen. But otherwise, like, um, you know, I just try and rotate everyone through and I try and get people uh, heading to different zones um, to see as much of the park and a variety of fishing as possible. So basically you got breakfast. You, at that point you can kind of see like, okay, I'm stuck with Jake for the day and we're uh, going to. And you, you switch, know. you switch uh, guides every day. You might have a different guide every day. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, you'll okay. probably, you'll, right. if you're unlucky, you'll fish with me a couple of times. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, we kind of rotate it and um, yeah, just like keep cool. things interesting and, you know, fishing's awesome, Steve, but. I'm sure you can agree that it's all the other stuff, right? It's the adventure, it's the people, the whole yeah. deal, right? So we kind of yeah. mix it up and um, that gives us something to talk about at breakfast, right? You're like, okay, sweet. I'm with, uh, you know, Bob's with Dawson. So he starts yakking with him like, whoa, okay, we're going to Tatlatui. Like I've heard about this place, like what's going on in Tatlatui? And then, yeah. um, you know, over breakfast, we kind of download any intel or what's going on or, or the best flies or what we're seeing in terms of uh, aquatic behavior, et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, yeah, we kind of eat and get prepared. And then we start doing fly outs at uh, around nine. And okay. so depending on where you're going, you hop into one of the planes. We got a, um, we've usually got a beaver and a 185 on site and then a couple of uh, boats as well. So you're there hopping in like the jet boat or one or the lake boat or you're, or you're hopping in one of the planes. And um, we usually do pairs. So it'll be like two clients and one guide. And, um, off you go. It might be a, yeah, it might be a short or long boat ride. It might be a, a just a little hop to a neighboring lake, or you might be in the plane for 45 minutes, oh, right. uh, depending okay. on what we're doing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you kind of, you head out, you get to your spot. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things trying to mess with you from weather to mechanics to, you know, or just clients Who starting knows? to chill out throughout the course of the week so you know it's nine o'clock nine o'clock sharp um yeah ish and then and uh, clients you know, are late for for takeoff i would not be late i would be there not day. not the first day not the second day but <laughs> it gets it's pretty you know what the best weeks are pretty casual and like um yeah everyone everyone tends to have a you know for the for the most part everyone seems to fill their boots but anyway you head out yeah you have a you have a day angling in whatever you know drainage watershed type of spot that you're headed to that day and stay again there. you know you stay in that one spot kind of all day to move around and yeah the spot but you're you're there in that drainage for that day well we've got boats stashed at lots of places so okay more often than not you've got a boat there whether it's like a little you know a little kind of metal boat in varying degrees of decay. Some of them are pretty sweet. Some of them are like, uh, I'm not getting in that. Uh, but we got boats stashed all over the place. And then um, if, so if you're on the first fly out, we usually do two fly outs, right? So you're on the first fly out, you're going to get a bit of a longer day, but you're, you're on your own, right? So it's just you and the guide and maybe a boat, or maybe you're just, you're just there until you get picked up at the end of the day. If you're the second flight out, you're usually being guided by the actual pilot of the plane. And so, you know, it's not uncommon where I'm like, okay, you guys are going with Tim, uh, you know, one of the most experienced dudes and crazy, you know, like most talented bush pilots in Northern BC. You guys are with Tim. You're going to, you know, whatever. You're going to Kitchener for the day. And then they'll get back. I'll be like, how was Kitchener? It'd be like, oh, it was awesome. We were there for like an hour, but then we flew to Tatatui and then we flew over to whatever. It's like, you know, so I don't know. You just do whatever you do. We do, um, 
we do lunch out on the river. Uh, this might seem kind of crazy. I don't know, depending on where you're from, but we, we bring, you know, we bring a lunch out, but then we also usually, uh, if the clients want, we'll keep a couple of rainbow and we'll cook them up on the, yeah on the bank. Sure, and, yeah. um, there's, there's a really, really healthy population of rainbow in most of these spots. There's some spots that we won't, um, keep yeah. fish, but lots of the spots we do. So we'll do yeah. kind of like a shore lunch often fire conditions permitting. We'll do that. Or we've got little stoves. Um, but yeah, we'll just hang out for the day and then, um, we'll see how punctual we can be getting back to the ranch around, you know, five or six. And then okay. we do, you know, dinner in the lodge and, uh, or out around the fire and then, yeah. And then fire and fire and cocktails and lying about whatever fish he caught. And sure. Then yeah. Does anybody go to bed and do it again? Do you have clients that, you know, start get antsy, want to go cast off the dock or walk around the lake a little bit and do some fishing? Oh, hundred percent. Like, Almost every week there's like the super frothy guys and frothy. Uh, oh, <laughs> big great. time. Yeah. So, sometimes it's like, sometimes it's, you know, the whole crew for a couple of days, but often there are like, I can think of a few people that have been coming up for years and they're, you know, they're out every morning and they're out every evening, you know, oh, and they just, I mean, yeah. it's such an incredible place and you spend all the energy getting up there and it's like, you know what? I'll sleep when we get home. Like, yeah, I'm the fish. Yeah. I'm always, it's pretty fun the river. So that'd be me. I'd there you be go. Frothy. I'd be your, you'd be, customer. Dude. you'd be that dude heading out, <laughs> putting dinner Probably. in like a, putting dinner yeah. in a, on a plate and putting some beers in your pocket and off in the boat. And, well, I can and put that's, some beers that's in my a, pocket. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hang, hang and that's, a, that's a, huh? what's that? I was going to hang a koozie off my, uh, my waiting belt and put a beer in there. Yeah. I've, I've been known to do that. That sounds pretty good. It's pretty, you know what? I have a feeling, Steve, you'd slip right in. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you mean float that like fall in. <laughs> or I'd fit in. I have a feeling you'd slip right into the lake. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. There you go. That's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> hey man, two's my limit. You know, I, I'm not a big drinker. I'll drink two beers right. in the evening. And that's it. So unless yeah, yeah. you've got some really good bourbon, I might taste a little right. bit too. Um, right. All right. So tell me about the wildlife. So I know you've got, bears wolves caribou moose goats what else you got up there and what what kinds of stuff have you seen what kind of wild wildness have you seen yeah that's um that's kind of the gamut we don't okay things it's easier to say what we don't have we don't have um deer for whatever reason huh. deer don't make it up that far north huh. um and so maybe because of that we don't see i haven't seen or really heard of um big cats but we do have yeah. a lot of moose and caribou. I guess numbers have been dwindling a bit, right? There used to be a lot thicker of both. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's a it's an interesting topic for sure of um, what's going on. But the predator numbers kind of ebb and flow with the moose and caribou uh, numbers. So, um, you know, where there's moose and caribou, there are also you know, packs of wolves that vary in numbers. There yeah. are also grizzly bears chasing around the ungulates, especially in the spring when calving is going on. And then um, we've got a ton of black bears too. We've got, uh, yep, we've got wolverines, um, tons of like beavers, uh, all kinds of stuff, like smaller stuff, you know, ermine and um, squirrels and chipmunks and tons cool. of birds. I don't want to sound uh, too dorky here, but I love birds and uh, just got like a beautiful array of uh, different types of birds. Um, birds that like nest eagles, hawks, uh, yeah, got... we've got eagles and we got swallows. We got Arctic terns. We got wood cool. ducks. We got swans. We got um, yeah, all different types of like waterfowl and we've got ptarmigan running around and um, warblers. It's 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 a really beautiful place from the yeah. standpoint of. Um, just taken in nature and and a different kind of untouched zone. Sounds awesome. Um, what, but yeah, usually. Quick. Go ahead. Finish your thought. Well, um, yeah, the animals are kind of doing their own thing, but um, the lodge definitely uh, has an impact on the environment. So we've got, um, you know, it's constantly a bit of uh, a bit of uh, you know give and take, trying to keep critters out of everything. Um, last yeah. year we had a ermine, I named it peewee ermine and it lived in the life jacket 
uh, kind of storage shed and then had a family. So Pee Wee Herman's family lives there and we keep them around cause they eat, they eat all the, um, the lemmings and the mice and stuff. But then we, then we've got, you know, squirrels causing havoc constantly and, um, and bears like bears is the big one. Right. And like, so this June, I don't know what's going to happen. The place gets locked up for the winter. Um, I guess it gets checked on once uh, the Browns, a family that helps us up there and has, have been working at the lodge for a long time. They, they go up in the winter land on the lake on skis and do firewood, get that sorted. So they check on it in the winter, but we, and so maybe sometimes I'll get a, I'll get a call or a text or word that um, a bear has done some damage, Yeah. but more often it's right in the spring before we get there. Um, you know, I don't know why, but the hunting camps seem to get it worse where grizzly bears will just completely break in and completely destroy a cabin. Um, really? We've had our kitchen ripped up since I've been there, but, um, but yeah, uh, the, the bears, there's tons of bears around and they're always coming into camp and we're always trying to keep them away. So it's a yeah, bit of fun. So what do you, have you had bears come into camp when you've had clients around and what do you, what do you guys do? Well, we've got a secret weapon, Steve. Uh, her name's Becky Joe, and uh, she's uh, our guest services manager. She's, you know, uh, just a sweet, sweet, pretty, pretty young thing, you know, just a lovely young lady. Uh, you wouldn't think uh, she'd be too dangerous, but when the bears come around, she's our secret weapon. So um, she's firing warning shots and chasing them off. And, Is she? Okay. Um, yeah, she's pretty hardcore. And uh, well, it's sort of wild. Like when we're gone for the day, all the guides are gone. All the, you know, yeah. pilots are gone. Yeah. And so there's, you know, often there's, our chef and Becky Joe. And so she, uh, she protects the, <laughs> protects the camp. <laughs> Last year we had bears, uh, a lot of black bears coming into camp and, um, they were climbing in the boats that I don't know why, but they were really curious about the boats and they'd come and climb in the boats. So like walk out on the yeah. dock and then jump in a boat. The, um, okay. So the, the water levels go down throughout the year and it makes a little kind of narrow beach around all of these lakes. Right. Okay. And so all of the animals, they tend to get to the shoreline and then they just follow the beach. So they're all circling the, yeah. the, these lakes. So you can always see different tracks. You'll see like caribou tracks being followed by wolves, or you can see, you know, grizzlies following moose calves or whatever, but the bears, we've got a spotting scope in the lodge. We're right on the lake and we've got a spotting scope. So best thing to do in the morning, right? You get a cup of coffee and you start scoping the lake. Often you see bears swim in the lake or, swim. or, um, you know, goats cruising around on the mountain, but, um, you can see bears coming for a long time. Right. So you'll be like, oh yeah, there's one coming, you know, he's coming down this bank, coming down that bank and like coming um, our way. Sure like eventually he's going to get to camp probably. Exactly. Yeah. Oh. They're just working their way or it's like, okay, mom and a cub. Oh, we got like a couple two year olds, whatever. And, um, we've got, we've got a few dogs usually in, in camp, so they do oh. their job. But, um, but I would say Becky Jo is more effective. Um, <laughs> she's quite humble about it. Like if you ever get home, you're like, you know, you get back to the camp, you're like, Oh, how is, how is the day here? Oh yeah. I've had a couple bears, but other than that, all good. Yeah. Everything was yeah. great. Like, Oh yeah. Okay. But, um, I kind of got like a sneak peek at it. We, um, we had one of our longtime guests, his name is Ross, lovely dude. Um, from New York and he uh he was sort of a little tired fished out by I think like day five he's like I'm gonna take a take a break camp day maybe I'll fish around here but I'm just gonna chill out for the day sweet right on enjoy yourself got home we're having dinner that day or that night and everyone's like oh Ross like how was the day here you know like what was what do you do in camp all day and he was just like eyes like this big he's like is he is he eating a bear tenderloin for dinner you guys are like where'd you get that no we did no well <laughs> no we weren't in, eating a bear tenderloin we were eating our might have been i don't know actually the secrets <laughs> that go on when we're out i don't know but oh. uh no ross is like to the fellas like oh yeah th these two bears came around the corner here and they got in the boat you know like and they're rustling around everyone's like what and because he was sitting on the deck like within you know whatever 40 feet yeah. of the boat okay what did you do he's like well i didn't do anything becky joe came out what did becky joe do well, Becky Joe had a rifle. Becky Joe had a rifle. Everyone's like, you know, full attention. All the conversation stops. Sure, yeah. Like, what happened? Well, Becky Joe started shooting warning shots, you know, off like four feet behind it, four feet behind it, and and yeah. uh, and sent them running, and they haven't been back. It's like, really? So, 
Yeah. So she's, Becky Joe is our secret weapon with the it. bears. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I mean, then there's other like responsible, uh, less fun story things to do. You know, you're always um, trying to be careful with your food and things that smell and keep, keep camp immaculate so that you're not uh, okay. attracting anything. Right. We're, yeah. we're kind of, we're visitors in, in their home. So we try and right. act accordingly, but, um, but yeah, it does make it exciting. You're always more often than not, you're, you're seeing some kind of animal when you're out for the day and that's all part of the fun. You ever see wolves? Um, so I guess that not up there. I've never seen a wolf up there. I've seen lots of prints and, um, Interesting. Huh. heard them. Uh, and I, I guess I'd be like maybe one of the, one of the few people that could say that I haven't seen wolves up there. Everyone else has. Yeah. Um, but when I first got up there, there were wolves and there were, um, there was a lot of wolf sign and you could hear them and like, it was a problem. But then it seemed to start to taper off. Like there was a decline in moose and caribou and mm. there was also a decline in wolves. And so for like five years, I didn't see or hear, I saw like a couple of prints, but definitely not around our lodge and in this upper like kind of basin, like our home basin in the upper Stikine, I didn't see any wolves or, or nothing. But then last year, the night before I went home, I was lying in bed in this yurt and, uh, and I heard him go in. I heard him up in Tuaton howling this was uh the season before last last year there's wolf sign everywhere oh they're and coming back hear them yeah they're okay. back so yeah, it, it just kind of ebbs and flows yeah makes sense yeah yeah sure. um all right want to shift gears a little bit Jay. what's the history of this area because i know there's a couple of interesting stories about about this area isn't there so so it was founded uh by who and and they built a cabin on the fire steel i believe is that right Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a legendary story. The Collingwood brothers, um, th they weren't the first outfitters up there. There was uh, an outfitter before them, um, Tommy Walker and his wife, Marion, they were the first mm. outfitters to set up shop in, in the Spazzisi region, uh, on Coldfish Lake, which is North, uh, West of where we're at, but also in the Stikeen drainage, um, they set up shop and then, um, I don't know, a decade or so later, a, a new wave a couple other outfitters showed up and um ray and reg uh the collingwood brothers they they set up shop in the uh, upper stikine and in the fire steel and yeah the story story goes you know they were looking for a spot to set up this fishing and help hunting outfitting business um they got some intel the fire steel you got to go to the fire steel they got dropped off there um in this wide spot in the river where float planes can can safely land and they just, you know, kind of wandered through the bush, uh, you know, started fishing at the spot uh, that we still go today. It's called 126 and it's, it's uh, infamously named after the amount of fish that were caught on the same amount of cast 126. Really? And um, so right there, they're like, okay, well, I guess this is what we're doing for our entire life. I think they were in their twenties. So they like, caught 126 fish on 126 casts. I think Reg did, That's which amazing. is crazy because yeah, Reg yeah. is, I don't know if Reg can catch 126 fish. That's pretty good. <laughs> You're surprised by that, huh? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Oh, that's but great. he's uh he's more the hunting the hunting enthusiast. Um, he's pretty humble. He's the first to make fun of his casting and fishing. But sounds that's like funny. he did good that day. So they were hooped for the rest of their life. They were yeah. um, outfitters in the spats easy and uh, and they just had they they built they earned a, an incredible reputation in the hunting and fly fishing worlds and uh, became sort of regional legends up here so i grew up knowing about the calling woods and if you're uh, into fly fishing you know about ray and um you know about ray's daughter carrie who now uh, runs a steelhead lodge of her own on the babine and they're just this this kind of infamous family up here and so i was always yeah, eager cool. to um yeah to be a part of it but eventually they they uh, built a second place and um, a main lodge and it was a series of steps because it was a park by that time and there's regulations and sure. yada yeah. yada but eventually they um, were able to build the main lodge that we're at now Spatsy's Park Lodge and that's on Las Louis Lake. Yeah. How about that? Um, and was, go ahead. What, what's the story of the outlaw that visited you guys? I don't know how many years ago that was. What's the story of this oh. guy? Oh yeah right. Um, Gunanute. Right. 
Simon right. Demonude? Yes. Um, so I, I, I may get some of the details wrong here, but there was, there's an infamous tale. It's, it sort of sounds like I'm lying because I'm a fisherman and <laughs> well, I haven't uh, heard you yet. <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But so the largest manhunt in BC history is, uh, was after this fellow named Simon Gunnanute and, uh, yeah, there's a little mini documentary about it and you can read about it. But uh, essentially there was a murder and RCMP or Mounted Police was murdered in Hazleton. Um, when would this have been? I don't know. Years back. Anyway, but not too long ago, like 70s, 80s. Okay. And um, Simon Gunnanute got, it got pinned on Simon Gunnanute. And so... He's like, no, I don't think so. I did not do that. I'm out of here. And he split with his family and a wife. And um, he might have had kids on the run, but he had a couple of kids anyway. And he took his family on the run for years. And they just kept roaming. They went back to, um, you know, kind of the Statsizi region. And they were up in Iskit. And they were out um, kind of in the Arctic headwaters. And they spent a lot of time right where our lodge is as well. And wow. um, unfortunately, one of his sons, passed away while they were on the run and but it must have happened uh at last louis because there's a grave site right behind well a little ways back okay. behind the lodge um got simon gunn newt's son's grave oh his son and, um, okay yeah and then you know his his legacy eventually he was acquitted he had a lawyer that he was somehow communicating with this is quite a quite a while before Starlink, as you can imagine. So somehow he was getting message back and forth and he had a lawyer um, representing him on the, you know, back in civilization. And yeah. eventually after many years on the run, he was acquitted huh. and um, some kind of fun. There's a, there's a pass near us just East of us called lawyers pass, um, which, uh, you know, I never knew what the name was for, but um, one of our pilots, Keith was filling me in this past season that when, Simon McGunnan, who finally was acquitted, he he wanted to like say thank you to his lawyer. So he invited him up on this like kind of hunting, whatever, fishing trip. And and they didn't make it too far, but they made it they made it in a bit to this pass. So they called it lawyer's pass. Okay. How about that? So yeah, there's there's uh, you know, there's these legendary kind of tales of um the folks that have been there and um and there's still, you know, a lot of sign, whether it's grave sites or old cabin sites or um the trails huh. that uh, folks were walking uh, back before roads and cars and before they were all um, basically moved out of there uh, that we try and, you know, maintain and, um, and more importantly, maintain the story of, and, uh, you know, continue, continue to share that knowledge yeah. and try and preserve it. And there's a few, few great books written about Spat Easy from different perspectives. Huh. And, um, yeah, and there's still still some elders that lived there as children in these um, communities. There used to be some small communities near us. Now there's nothing, but there is a little town, I don't know, probably 10, 10 kilometers as the crow flies called Metzentan near a lodge. No one lives there now, but um, some kids that used to live there are now elders up in Iskit and the Deese Lake area. So, um, huh. yeah, there's a lot of history, and I'm still learning a lot of it myself, but it's uh, a big part of the tapestry of what makes that place special and, yeah, and pretty uh, cool. important. So what was life like growing up in Smithers? <laughs> um, awesome. You know what? Yeah. I didn't um, – yeah, I, I liked it. It's a small town, right? So as a kid, you, you, you know, there's lots to do, out, outdoor stuff. There's a ski hill and there's uh, – I, you know, I never, I never really even got into fly fishing. I thought that was an old man's game. And I, uh, huh. you know, I, I liked fishing, but like I didn't, and I saw these, you know, dudes coming in and doing the yeah, steelhead yeah, thing, yeah. but it didn't really grab my attention. But um, yeah, there was lots of fun stuff to keep, uh, keep you busy. And, um, and just like an amazing sense of community in Smithers. Uh, I appreciate it now coming back, like all of the, the people that would have been young adults there, they all, they all know you and everyone's looking out for each other. It's one of those yeah. Yeah. communities where everyone's kind of co-raising all the kids and. Oh, really? Um, okay. Everybody knows know, everybody. Just, like if you get in trouble, the whole town knew. Is that right? hundred percent. Oh, hundred <laughs> percent. There's no okay. secrets up here for better or worse. For worse. It's just for, for worse. worse. Maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just, it's a great place, man. It's like, if you're into nature, if you're into fishing, if you're right. whatever, it's, it's a beautiful spot to be. And, um, just an amazing, 
uh, yeah, amazing type of people live up here. The kind of the kind of people that come here and stay here are the kind of people that are passionate about it and and yeah. um, want to make it better and share it. So, right, I'm biased, but uh, maybe a little. I bit. think it's the best That's place on earth. No kidding. Um, and but you didn't fish at all as a kid, or you just didn't fly fish as a kid. I just didn't fly fish. Like I, I really liked fishing. Okay. But um, I don't know. My parents would take me out to fishing derbies and we'd do troll wedding bands and I'd fish whatever with worms, like all the things you do as a kid and yeah. blue foxes and stuff. But it wasn't really till after high school where I started like mucking around with, with uh, fly fishing. And I, as every, um, as every kid is, you know, supposed to do when you grow up in a small town, you leave immediately when you graduate. So I, took off to different places and um along the way you know they they all every place i ended up in kind of seemed like a fishing zone actually whether it's Kamloops oh. or whistler jasper jackson hole and so i i started picking up fly fishing and exploring all these other places and getting more and more into it yeah. and uh the more kind of passionate and and immersed in fly fishing i got the more i realized that like i need to get home like i live in yeah i live in Paradise. the best right yeah what am i doing so yeah. long so story came... short yeah good. yeah i i came home i uh, my uh, sisters are here my parents are here and, and um yeah i've got a great family and we're in this like really fortunate sweet spot where everyone's healthy and we got new yeah. nephews and and whatever and so yeah I, i've come here and i've met miguel emma and uh yeah just like jumped all into fly fishing and all in. and yeah uh yeah, yeah that's kind of how she went so where, where did you meet emma uh, well, I met Emma. Emma is actually how I got the job at Spats Easy. So that's a good question. Uh, I know the answer, I, uh, this, moved... but nobody else does. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. I queued you up. Um, <laughs> I met Emma. I'd been, I'd been, I'd moved back home to Smithers and uh, I'd kind of been bumming around. I was probably, um, yeah, I don't know, 30 or something. And I'd moved back into my parents' basement. And, uh, oh, man. Yeah. And I guess I was, uh, well, I was working and stuff. Uh, I didn't yeah. see any problem with my uh, with my position in life. But after a year, year and a half, or frig, I don't know, maybe two years, my uh, sister Janelle came up to me. She's like, "Hey, do you want me to like set you up with a friend?" And Get I you like, out of that basement. Janelle. I was like, "Janelle, what are you talking about? Like, I don't need to set up with a friend. Like, look at me. I'm I'm yeah, awesome. Man, I'm cool, man. Like, I live in my parents' like, basement. You're like, There's nothing wrong here." You can't live in your, you can't live in our parents' basement when you're in your thirties, man. Like, <laughs> yeah. So as a humbling, mo anyway, Janelle works fast. I think it was like two days later. Um, I was invited to go skiing with my brother and my brother-in-law and a buddy and um, the buddy's sister was Emma. So oh. up, up came my, uh, my ski crew and, and there was Emma with the ski crew. I was like, Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. We've, here we go. And so right. we went ski touring. We had a good time and, um, Emma is a chef and she'd been working at all these, all of these like famous fishing lodges. And so we got to yakking about that when, um, we were skiing together and she'd been, you know, working down on the Dean river, which I'd always wanted to go. And she'd be, yeah, you know, working at big. these lodges on the Bulkley. And then, you know, it came up like, yeah, I, she cooks at spats easy with Ray Collingwood. I was like, no way. And she's like, yeah, uh, you know what? I think they actually might need a guide this year. And, uh, I'm in. <laughs> yeah. For like at least two reasons I am in. And uh, yeah. And so, and you know what, before the pandemic, um, the whole fishing scene up here, whether you wanted to be a guide or whether you wanted to be an outfitter or whether you wanted to be a chef, everything was locked up and all the positions were tight and you really needed to know someone to get into it. Okay. And um, it just so happened that uh, I lucked out there meeting Emma and she introduced me to Ray and, um the rest is history How about that so i thought maybe you met her up there but she she actually just told you come on up i'm the chef and i might better get you a job and it all worked well, out she said she said i was the chef and i i yeah i connected some dots and i was like i gotta get there all right so let me ask you this this is i always got to throw in a couple of deep questions so look back at yourself as a teenager what advice would you give yourself as a teenager looking back Hmm. That's an interesting one. Um, I'd probably say, I'd probably say not to take decisions so seriously, um, just to keep moving forward, you know, um, follow 
follow curiosity. If you're curious about something, if you enjoy something, if you're having fun with something or you feel like something's important, you know, tug on that yarn, follow that path and don't think, don't overthink it. Just wake up, open the door, go outside and, and move forward because you learn lessons no matter what you do, you learn lessons, you learn what you like, you learn what you don't like, and you find the next thing, right? It's just steps yeah. bringing you in a, in a path. And you can, you can sit at home worrying about which way you want to go or trying to, um, you know, architect some master plan to get to where you want to go. But um, the more, the more I've just let go and, and acted as opposed to, to think, uh, to thinking about stuff, um, the better, the yeah. better uh, experience I've ended up having. So yeah, it's great advice. I love that. Yeah. Just do there, stuff. There's actually a book out there called the progress principle. And the whole thing is that people are the, the biggest motivational factor for people in, in business is making progress and lack right. of progress is the biggest demotivator. When you think about it, like what you said, like, I'm not just going to sit here. I'm going to keep moving. It's kind of right. like how I fish. You know, I don't stay in one, one spot to do for, for, for very long. I always yelled at my buddies, you, keep moving. You've cast in there 30 times. They're not going to take that. Keep moving, you know? <laughs> I think. Well, I think that's a great way to fish. Sounds like we'd yeah. be good fishing buddies. I love just moving like that. Keep and moving. yeah, it's, I think it's good advice, right? Like action um, precedes motivation. It's a muscle that you can build up. Yeah. And um, if you're good at you know, waking up and doing stuff like you build in that work ethic and you build in that routine, yeah. I'm not saying I'm a master at it, but, um, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, motions, the lotion, you gotta keep, keep moving one foot in front of the other. And, uh, life's a fun ride if you, if you go for it. So you got to get on. Keep going. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Well, another question. What's the best piece of advice you, you've gotten about, about managing a lodge? Hmm best piece of advice about managing a lodge i guess i've had a couple of amazing mentors like i got into guiding a little later in life and uh the first family that i started guiding for i'm, I'm gonna answer this the long way um but uh i guess i i decided i wanted to guide later in life like i was you know coming up on 30 or so and um I went for a fishing trip with some buddies and they were all guides and I was, you know, slugging it out, trying to do business stuff. And all my buddies that were fishing guides were just having a hoot and they were way better anglers than me. And they were, they all knew how to drive jet boats and raft and they'd all been to all these crazy spots. And so, you know, throughout the course of this fishing trip over the weekend, I was like, you know, man, this, what am I doing? I got to, this is what's up. And so I, I remember dropping just kind of a little hint. I think it laid around a fire one night, like, Oh man, I wouldn't mind guiding. You guys think like, what do you, what, what? you know, anyway, so immediately like good friends, I just got completely razzed and torn apart and everyone's like, Oh, you really? can't, be, whatever, oh, really? you can't uh -huh. even cast man. Blah, blah, blah. Um, but, <laughs> but after that fishing trip, everyone, everyone reached out and sent, you know, little leads like, Hey, apologize. You know, no, 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 no. <laughs> but, but you know, like uh, with love and good intention, you know, like, well, if you want to start, you know, this would be a good place. These would be good guys to start with. Don't go here. Don't go here. Yeah. Um, this guy might be looking, this guy might be looking. So okay. I narrowed Joking. down like, yeah, yeah so I, I took it very cautiously where I wanted to start guiding and, um, I ended up getting, uh, sort of a dream job. If in terms of steelhead guiding, I ended up, my first steelhead job was for the Lee family, for Tom Lee, um, on the Kispiox river. And, uh, it's just an incredible lodge, uh, which just recently has, kind of finished and the raw days have been sold, but it was, it was in the family for uh, multiple generations going back yeah. to actually spats easy roots. And um, Tom was an incredible mentor in, in what he said, but more what he didn't say, just watching the way that he would prepare for the season and watching how he would interact with the clients and watching uh, the, the fine, but definite line he would ride between um, being extremely, professional and extremely detail oriented. Um, but then also being just an absolute hoot to hang out with and, you know, the last guy up around the fire and, uh, huh. you know, just, so, so I got to, I got to watch firsthand, um, and, and let some, 
let some kind of muscle memory come through osmosis and, yeah, and just sure. being part of the team with Tom Lee at hook and line and uh, with his dad, Wilfred. Um, I, I guess it was, it was to be extremely prepared and be extremely professional and have everything thought out before people show up. So worst case scenarios don't happen, but yeah. it, you know, if, if they do, you can handle them and you know what to do. Um, but then once the guests show up, you know, just have fun and, have and fun. Uh, en enjoy the experience. Um, that's cool. Yeah. I yeah. I, I, everyone's got a different, uh, every outfitter and every lodge manager and every guide has a different personality and that's, that's part of the fun of it, right? We're all kind of misfits, anglers included and the clients <laughs> included. And, um, and part of the fun of it is, uh, just bringing your authentic self to the, to the experience and, yeah. and enjoying, enjoying other people, um, and what they bring. And yeah, I don't know if, um, if I had to mold myself into someone different to do this, I wouldn't do it at all. And if it wasn't good fun, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Um, good for you. So, so yeah, we're just, right. uh, yeah, I don't know. All right. Back Have to fishing. Fun. What are your top confidence patterns? Two, three, four um, confidence patterns. Okay. You, you always take have... these flies. What do they always have with you flies? Okay. Um, always have with you flies four or five. Okay. First one, um, Adams parachute Adams, like pretty parachute. small classic. Uh, another dry fly I always have is a Tom thumb as crazy Tom as, thumb. as it sounds. Tom thumb. I don't even know what that is. Tom thumb. Oh yeah. Check it out. It's just like deer hair, like the most simple tie you've ever seen. Um, really? yeah, it looks like a two year old tied it. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and they do it, they do them in black or natural kind of brown deer hair. Yeah. Uh, I, Tom thumb, like, if you don't know where you're going, stimulators, right? That's another, shot. like the spoon of flies. Um, but then, you know, okay, so can I have six? Well, let's have six. Yeah. I, lo I love foam <laughs> flies. Like I love big hoppers. You mentioned that. Um, okay. Yeah, it's just fun, right? Like you're not gooping them up every two seconds. And yeah, um, keep fishing. Yeah. And it, probably, I don't know for sure most of the time, but like maybe 80, 90% of the time that I'm up in spats easy, I've got a big like purple and black foam hopper and I break the hook off and that's what I fish with. Okay. Just tease them. Yeah. Well, yeah. Just, just having fun. Right. I don't know. Right. Cast, you still find them. You still get some pulls and it's, they jump and yeah. I don't know. Like, oh, uh, I still like to see the odd fish and bring it in and give it a smooch or put it on the frying pan. But like most of the time I just have like a hookless foam thing and, um really? even talked yeah. to a few clients into doing it too yeah um okay so foam so i do the adams tom thumb a foam fly um we also have a a, a sort of a larger pattern we've got a royal madam x which sure. looks like kind of a yeah you may just, you've probably seen that yeah. like a like a royal wolf on steroids some rubber legs and yeah. a nice big parachute so you can see it that seems yeah. to be a really great uh, attractant depend like regardless of where you are and then um you know you always got to bring like a couple subsurface things just in case you know i i bring a you know i don't know i'd hate to admit it but i'll bring like a like a black leech like a little black leech yeah. and, uh, and then some kind of little nymph like a very small nymph um if i wasn't in spats easy i'd say like my last fly i'd put in my like very select box would be like a prince nymph That's but, okay yeah but up there in spats easy, like a, a small green or blue, like really tiny nymph. Um, we've got lots of like scuds and Ray calls them shrimp, but just like uh, green and, and kind of turquoise yeah. scuds. And so if everything's turned off completely, um, yeah, that's, that's like a, that saved okay. me a bunch of times. No egg patterns. No, I, no. Nah. Not going to do that. No. Not gonna stupid, uh, like though. whatever i don't want to like come off like a snob like whatever i don't care but uh steve like i like fishing but like if i wanted to catch a bunch of fish i'd like be checking a blue fox or like trolling or yeah fishing an egg um we wouldn't be fishing like dries or or like flies you with no hooks make it interesting yeah i yeah. don't know i'm up there for the adventure and the and the people and the interactions and like i love fish don't get me wrong but um but yeah like I, I guess I grew up also like the fly fishing world that I'm in is um, very much like anti-egg kind of. Oh, really? Interesting. Huh. Or 
like we all know that eggs work like yep eggs work but um yeah i don't know it's just like yeah. the evolution the evolution of you know starting with the worm and then eventually you get to the fly and um yeah yeah uh <laughs> so i'm gonna apologize, <laughs> rambling on, but no i'm gonna apologize to all you bc folks that are just that i brought up the egg pattern so there you no, go no <laughs> hey there's lots of lots of lots of folks fish eggs here and that's all cool uh lots of you know what okay so i'm acting all hoity-toity like i don't fish eggs egg sucking leech and like lots of the intruders we fish for steelhead have like an egg head yeah, sure yeah i mean it's, so, yeah, you got to do that right okay you mentioned yeah. you mentioned cooking trout for shore lunch how do you how do you like to cook your trout for shore lunch oh i don't know if we have time to get into this this is a real this one is minute hot That's topic it. steve <laughs> is it? okay all right no no everyone's okay i'll tell you well everyone's got their their different method right uh um you know some people do it in the frying pan uh, when Emma's the chef, she'll often send me out with a little cheater pack, you know, some burnt butter or some different herbs or spices, whatever. We'll do it in the pan sometimes if it's like, if we got to be fast about it, just turn it on the stove. But my favorite way to cook the fish is I'll make a little frying pan out of um, Arctic birch or, or whatever kind of like willow or whatever I can find. Really? And I'll weave up a quick little frying pan and um, then I'll collect like a little bushel, just quickly chop a bunch of Arctic birch or um, there's a few different... Uh, kind of deciduous shrubs up there that have a really nice aromatic smoke and I'll get a little bushel of that and we'll do a quick kind of um, kind of fire roast smoke um, with the trout. And that's uh that's super fun and, right, and delicious. Back up. How do you make a frying pan out of a piece of birch? <laughs> uh, actually, I made kind of a silly video about it on my Instagram. You can check Did it you? out, but you, are you, are you, you get a nice long it? one. Yeah. You get a nice long kind of like older one and old it's one nice what? if it had tons uh like piece of piece like of a piece of arctic birch or willow okay. all right something with a bunch of branches on it oh and then you cut the whole thing off and you just take the top and you loop it around and then you know you can kind of cut a little slot in it with a knife and shove the end through and yeah. then you just start weaving weaving the branches back and forth and then from there i grab like a few more sticks and kind of thread them in crossways and before you know it, it's like pretty skookum little dish and really? you can check uh yeah you can check like whatever four or six little fillets on there and um it's kind of oh. fun right so it's, it's almost like a grill it's like a little hand grill yeah oh, okay all right well, i'm thinking frying pan like you got some butter like how could that even like hold butter it would, but it's more like well a grill. keeping the fish on there is like the it's a black belt technique steve and i'm not <laughs> okay uh, all right it <laughs> Six Sigma black belt guy on, on uh, fish, fish and trout on a, on a fire up there. That sounds great. That's super cool. Can I get a, I'd love to get a picture of that. Yeah, absolutely. I'll send, send one through you. That. And the... that and maybe a couple of shots of some of your top confidence patterns. Cause some of these, I think people have heard of, but some maybe not. So people love that. Okay. I'll Social deep uh, dig into the secret stash for you. Yeah. Some for yeah. your show notes. We forgot our frying pan back at the camp. So we're weaving one up here. <laughs> I think it looks pretty good. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Hey, voila. Look at that. Perfect. Golden trout. Let's serve it up and see what people think. Good? Oh, scrumptious. So moist. Melts in your mouth. You know, this is a loaded question, but how's the food in the lodge? Um, <laughs> you better say yeah, good like, things. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, my wife Emma is the chef sometimes. Exactly. And if, if it's not yeah. her, then it's often her sister Jen uh, okay. Anderson, uh, and uh, those girls are amazing, amazing chefs. And huh. yeah, it's it's one of the it, it can really save your bacon in a fishing situation, right? If you don't get out because of weather, or if uh, the fishing's kind of slow, uh, you always yeah. know if you can come home to a five star meal, um, then they you're you're laughing right away, right? Yeah, but it's incredible. It's it's uh, too fancy. We've got to fly in everything, right? We've got to oh, fly sure. in every egg and every stick of butter and oh. every fork and nail. So it's it's quite a mission to fly in all our food each week. But um, yeah, this is no hunting spike camp. We do um, like full kind of family style buffets in the morning, oh, nice. you know, whether it's, you know, bennies or different like sausage and bacon and omelets and like there's a full spread and oatmeal and toasts if whatever. And then... Um, for lunch, kind of told you about that a little bit, a little more simple sandwich and trout and maybe soup yeah. if it's raining kind of deal out on the water. And then for dinner, it's a full on uh, spectacle. We do um, appy hour, uh, an hour before dinner. So 
can't recall right now. It's winter, so it's like it's far away from the sea. I'm kind of getting stoked for the season, just chatting with you. <laughs> but we do like we do appies an hour before dinner, so it gives everyone time to uh, have a cocktail or or um, okay. you know or whatever, a glass of water and uh, and some delicious appetizers and and sort of catch up and wait for the stragglers. You know, there's always stragglers, just the nature uh, of the adventures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then for dinner, it's a three course deal and there's a starter and a main and a dessert. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's like five star, five star, uh, five star deal. That's right. sounds like I would gain weight if I went up there for a week. A week's not bad, but if if you do a whole (laughs) season, I'll tell you from experience, you you can roll out of there pretty easily. Well, yeah. Get married to a five-star chef. I mean, you're, you're doomed, man. You you are not going to die a a skinny guy. (laughs) You're going to be. Well, what about you? What's going on over there? You must, uh, you you, you Uh, must be. uh... My wife's a good cook, but you know, I, I stay, uh, I work out, you know, all the time. (laughs) So, you know, I keep it off. It's getting harder and harder. The older you get though, you got to know that, right? Jake? It's a little hard. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm already starting to experience that. So yeah, it's like, man, what happened to my solar? I haven't seen my solar plexus since 1985. What's that? All <laughs> <laughs> Some guys can skip dessert. Eh? I've seen those guys. I don't know what's Yeah, I never them. skip dessert. That's my problem. No. Dessert, maybe, <laughs> maybe a little cocktail too. I kind of like that too. There you go. You know? So anyway. Right on. Hey man, great having you on the show, Jake. It'll be fun talking to you. Yeah, you as well. Thanks a lot. And feel like uh, kind of weird. I just talked about myself the whole time, but uh, that's what you do on podcasts. You know, you're oh, my guest. That's how this right? works. Yeah. It's about you, man. You're the star of the show. So anyway, well, so, uh, so how yeah, can people well, get thanks in touch for having you? me on and yeah. And just b- before, uh, yeah, before um, you had me on and once you first reached out, I listened to a bunch of the episodes and I just really love what you're doing. And it's a thanks. cool, um, it's a really neat opportunity for folks, including myself from around the world to, to have these, you know, kind of parachute into completely yeah. different worlds. Like we're all, all of us anglers from around the world, from these different destinations, we all share a, a passion and I'm sure many similar aspects to what make us tick and what keep us smiling. But, um, you know, we also live in these like completely different worlds. So thanks yeah. for doing what you do and, um, and keep doing it. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. It's, we all have that gene, you know, and it's, and it is a gene because I've tried to convince people that don't have it to come fishing and they just they're not interested and i'm like i don't get right. you but that's okay <laughs> one less guy i'm going to be bumping into when i'm fishing so anyway yeah. all right so how can people get in touch with you if they want to look into the lodge and learn a little bit more uh yeah i think we're just spatseasy.com um there's two sides there but the the fishing side's us and um there's contact information there to get a hold of the office we've got it's it's a bit of a wait list to get in but you never know there's um things can happen and yeah. um but yeah, there's uh, Jackie, our admin manager, aka the person that keeps everything moving and organized, and um, uh, she she will be happy to answer any questions you have and um, and get that's you on the bear list. Lady, if you... is it? That's not the bear lady. Pardon me? Is, it? is that the bear lady? The no, lady that's that Becky Joe. That's Becky Joe. Okay, all right. Yeah, she wants. Jackie you runs everything, <laughs> runs everything until you get into camp, and then Becky Joe is the boss. All right, gotcha. All right, yeah. very good. So but go uh, Spat's easy, and um, I think you can find us on uh, you can find us on the gram and on uh, yeah, you can find us on the gram and you can find us on the website and very good. Um, yeah, awesome. I wish you extraordinary success and all your adventures to follow, folks. And thank you for listening. Uh, we'll be sure to post uh, Jake's information on the Destination Anger show notes and pictures, hopefully, of some of those top fly picks and maybe that. Uh, that frying pan from a piece of birch. There you go. That'd be interesting. We'll put that out on Facebook and Instagram if they'll let me. Folks, you can always DM me or email me with comments and suggestions at shag50 at gmail.com. And if you like the show, please share it with a buddy. As always, our music is by our brother's fountain. Hope you enjoy the show and we will see you again soon. Tight lines, everybody. <laughs>